Chapter Two, Part Two of Rainy Week by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Lee. Not exactly a whole wreck it had proved to be. Not shattered spars and masts and crumpled cabins with plush cushions floating messily about, but at least it was a real trunk from a real wreck. Mrs. Brunswick had spied it first. Just back of a long, brown, untidy line of flotsam and jetsam, the seaweeds, the dead fish, the old bales and boxes that every storm brings to the beach, Mrs. Brunswick had spied the trunk lurching up half embedded in the sand. It must have come in on the biggest wave of all some time during the night. It was awfully wet, and yet not so awfully wet. Everybody agreed, that is, that it wasn't waterlogged, that it hadn't, in short, been rolling around in the sea for weeks or months but bespoke a disaster as poignantly recent as last night on the edge of this very storm indeed that they themselves were now frivoling in for fully half an hour it appeared before even so much as touching the trunk they had raced up and down the beach hunting half hopefully half fearfully for some added trace of wreckage the hunched body even of a survivor but even with this shuddering apprehension once allayed, the original discovery had not proved an altogether facile adventure. It had taken indeed at the last all their combined energies and ingenuities to open the trunk. The bride had broken two fingernails. George Keats had lost his temper. Paul Brunswick, in a final flare of desperation, had kicked in the whole end with an abandon that seemed to have been somewhat of an astonishment to everybody. Even from the first, young Kenilworth had contested that the thing smelt dead. But this unhappy odor had been proved very fortunately to be nothing more nor less than the rain-sloved coloring matter of the bride's pondly hat. And here is what we found in the trunk, thrilled the bride, in the palm of her extended hand lay a garnet necklace, fifty stones perhaps, flushing crimson dark in a silver setting of such unique beauty and such unmistakable Florentine workmanship as stamped the whole trinket indisputably precious, if not the stones themselves. And there were women's dresses in it, explained Paul Brunswick, rather queer-looking dresses, and, oh, it was the, the funniest trunk! cried the May girl. All! Her eyes were big with horror. Anybody could have Sherlocked at a glance, sniffed young Kenilworth, that it had been packed by a crazy person. No, I don't agree to that at all, protested the bride, whose own trunk-packing urgencies and emergencies were only too recent in her mind. Anybody's liable to pack a trunk like that when he's moving, the last trunk of all. Every leftover thing that you thought was already packed or that you had planned to tuck into your suitcase and found suddenly that you couldn't. Why, there was an old-fashioned copper chafing dish, sniffed young Kenilworth, and the top drawer of a sewing table fairly rattling with spools. And books, frowned George Keats, the weirdest little old edition of Pilgrim's Progress. And toys, quivered the May girl. A perfectly gorgeous brand new box of toy village as huge as oh it was awful as huge as that kicked young kenilworth rifly against the box at his feet i wanted to bring the chafing dish he scolded but nothing would satisfy this young idiot here except that we lugged the toy village one couldn't bring everything all at once deprecated the may girl perhaps tomorrow if it isn't too far, and we ever could find it again. But why such haste about the toy village, I questioned. Why not the dresses, the... Hopelessly, but with her eyes like blue skies, her cheeks like apple blossoms, the May girl tried to justify her mental processes. Probably I can't explain exactly, she admitted, but books and dishes and dresses being just things wouldn't mind being drowned, but toys, I think would be frightened with a frank expression of shock she stopped suddenly and stared all around her it doesn't quite make sense when you say it out loud does it she reflected but when you just feel it inside i brought the little pilgrim's progress back with me confessed george keats with the faintest possible smile 
not exactly perhaps because i thought it would be frightened but two nights shipwreck on a new england coast in this sort of weather didn't seem absolutely necessary and i brought the dinkiest little pearl-handled pistol brightened paul brunswick it's a peach tucked into the pocket of an old blue cape it was wonder i ever found it from a furious rummaging through her pockets the may girl suddenly withdrew her hand of course we'll have to watch the shipwreck news said the may girl or even advertise perhaps so maybe there won't be any real treasure trove after all but just to show that i thought of you mrs delville she dimpled here are four very damp spools of red sewing silk for your own work-table drawer maybe they came all the way from china and here's a i don't know what it is for alan john i think it's a whistle and here is a little not too soggy real morocco bound blank book for mr rollins when he comes downstairs again and and for mr delville i teased and for anne waltor with her hand slapped across her mouth in a gesture of childish dismay the may girl stared round at her companions oh dear oh dear oh dear she stammered none of us ever thought once of poor mr delville and miss waltor it's hot eatments and drinkments that you'd better be thinking of now i warned them all with real concern and blanket wrappers and downy quilts be off to your rooms and i'll send your lunches up after you and don't let one of you dare show his drenched face downstairs again until supper time then alan john and i resumed our reading aloud we read longfellow this time and a page or two of marcus aurelius and half a detective story and substituted orange juice very mercifully for what had grown to be a somewhat monotonous carousal in malted milk alan john seemed very much gratified with the little silver whistle from the shipwreck and showed quite plainly by various pursings of his strained lips that he was fairly yearning to blow it but either hadn't the breath or else wasn't sure that such a procedure would be considered polite really by six o'clock i had grown quite fond of alan john it was his haunted eyes i think and the lovely lean line of his cheek but whether he was animal vegetable mineral spiritual or intellectual i myself was not yet prepared to say the supper hour passed fortunately without fresh complications everybody came down everybody's eyes were like stars and everybody's complexion lashed into sheer gorgeousness by the morning's mad buffet of wind and wave best of all no one sneezed our little bride was a dream again in a very straight very severe grey velvet frock that sheathed her young suppleness like the suppleness of a younger crusader her regenerated beauty was an object lesson to all young husbands pocket-books for all time to come that beauty like love is infinitely more susceptible to bad weather than is either homeliness or hate and as such must be cherished by a man's brain as well as by his brawn paul brunswick goodness knows would never need to choose his bride's clothes for her but lusty young beauty lover that he was by every right of clean heart and clean living it was up to him to see that his beloved was never financially hampered in her own choosing a non-extravagant bride wrecked as his bride had been by the morning's tempest might not so readily have recovered her magic the may girl as usual was like a spray of orchard bloom in some white frothy midi blouse sort of effect with the may girl's peculiarly fragrant and insouciant type of youthfulness one never noted somehow just what she wore nor rated one day's mood of loveliness against another the essential miracle as of may time itself lay merely in the fact that she was here everybody talked of course about the shipwreck the bride did not wear her necklace it was too ghostly she felt but she carried it in her hand and brooded over it with the tender unshakable conviction that once at least it must have belonged to another bride rollins i thought was rather unduly enthusiastic about his share of the booty yet no one who knew rollins could ever possibly have questioned the absolute sincerity of him notebooks it appeared 
were a special hobby of his, morocco-bound notebooks particularly, and when it came to faintly soggy morocco-bound notebooks, words were inadequate, it seemed, to express his appreciation. Nothing would do but the May girl must inscribe it for him. Aberner Rollins, she wrote very carefully in her round, childish hand, with a giggly flourish at the tail-tip of each word, for Aberner Rollins from his friend May Davies. Awful shipwreck time, May 10th, 1919. Rollins used an inestimable number of notebooks, it appeared, in the collection of his statistics. The collection of statistics was the consuming passion of his life, he confided to everybody. The consuming passion, he reiterated emphatically. Already, he affirmed, he had revised and re-audited the whole fresh egg account of his own family for the last three generations. In a single slender tome, he bragged, he held listed the favorite flowers of all living novelists, both of America and England. Another tome bulged with the evidence that would-be suicides invariably waited for pleasant weather in which to accomplish their self-destruction. In regard to the little black Morocco volume, he kindled ecstatically, he had already dedicated it to a very interesting new thought which had just occurred to him that evening, apropos of a little remark, a most significant little remark that had been dropped during the breakfast chat. If anyone was really interested, he suggested hopefully. Nobody was the slightest bit interested. Nobody paid the remotest attention to him. Everybody was still too much excited about the shipwreck and planning how best to salvage such loot as remained. And maybe by tomorrow there will be even more things washed up, sparkled the May girl. A real India shawl, perhaps. A set of chessmen carved from a whale's tooth. Only, of course, if it should rain as hard, she drooped as suddenly as she had sparkled. It can't, said young Kenilworth. Even with the fresh crash of wind and rain at the casement, he made the assertion arrogantly. It isn't in the mind of God, he said, to make two days as rainy as this one. The little black Pomeranian believed him anyway, and came sniffing out of the shadows to see if the arrogantly gesticulative young hand held also the gift of lump sugar as well as of prophecy. It was immediately after supper that the May girl decided to investigate the possibilities and probabilities of her toy village. Somewhat patronizingly at first, but with a surprisingly rapid kindling of enthusiasm, young Kenilworth conceded his assistance. The storm outside grew wilder and wilder. The scene inside grew snugger and snugger. The room was warm, the lamps well shaded, the tables piled with books, the chairs themselves deep as waves. Loaf and let loaf was the motto of the evening. By pulling the huge wolfskin rug away from the hearth, the May girl and young Kenilworth achieved for their village a plane of smoothness and light that gleamed as fair and sweet as a real village common at high noon. Curled up in a fluff of white, the May girl sat cross-legged in the middle of it, superintending operations through a maze of sunny hair, stretched out at full length on the floor beside her, looking for all the world like some beautiful exotic-faced little lad. Young Kenilworth lay on his elbows, adjusting, between incongruous puffs of cigarette smoke, the faintly shattered outline of a miniature church and spire, or soothing a blister of salt sea tears from the paint-crackled visage of a tiny villa. Softly the firelight flickered and flamed across their absorbed young faces. Mysteriously, the wisps of cigarette smoke merged realities with unrealities. It was an entrancing picture, and one by one everybody in the room except Rollins and myself became drawn more or less into it. If you're going to do it at all, argued Paul Brunswick, you might as well do it right. When you start in to lay out a village, you know there are certain general scientific principles that must be observed. Now that list to the floor there. What about drainage? Can't you see that you've started the whole thing entirely wrong? 
but I wanted it to face toward the fire, drooped the May girl, like a village looking on the wonders of Vesuvius. Vesuvius nothing, insisted Paul Brunswick. It's got to have good drainage. Enchanted by his seriousness, the bride rushed off upstairs with her scissors to rip the foliage off her second-best hat to make a hedge for the churchyard. Even Alan John came sliding just a little bit out of his chair when he noted that there was a large, rather humpy papier-mâché mountain in the outfit that seemed likely to be discarded. "'I would like to have that mountain put there,' he pointed, "'against that table shadow, and the mountain's name is Blue Blur.' "'Oh, very well,' acquiesced everybody. "'The mountain's name is Blue Blur.' It was George Keats who suggested taking the little bronze psyche from the mantelpiece to make a monument for the public square. Of course there'll be some in your village, he deprecated, who'll object to its being a nude. But as a classic it... It's a bear, it's a bear, it's a bear, chanted Kenilworth in exultant falsetto. Speaking of classics... Hush, said George Keats. George Keats really wanted very much to play, I think, but he didn't know exactly how to, so he tried to talk highbrow instead. This village of yours, he frowned, I, I hope it's going to have good government. Well, it isn't, snapped young Kenilworth. It's going to be a terror, but at least it shall be pretty. Under young Kenilworth's crafty hand, the little village certainly had bloomed, from a child's pretty toy into the very real beauty of an artist's ideal. The skill of laying out little streets one way instead of another, the decision to place the tiny red schoolhouse here instead of there, the choice of a linden rather than a pine tree to shade an infinitesimal green-thatched cottage had all combined in some curious twinge of charm to make your senses yearn, not that all that cunning perfection should swell suddenly to normal real estate dimensions, but that you, reduced by some lovely miracle to toy size, might slip across that toy sized greensward into one of those toy sized houses and live with toy sized passions and toy sized ambitions and toy sized joys and toy sized sorrows one single hour of a toy sized life. Everybody, I guess, experienced the same strange little flutter. That house shall be mine, affirmed George Keats quite abruptly. That grey stone one with the big bay window and the pink rambler rose, the bay window room, I'm sure, would make me a fine study, and from an excessively delicate readjustment of a loose shutter on a rambling brown bungalow, young kenilworth looked up with a certain flicker of exasperation live anywhere you choose he snapped miss davies and i are going to live here w what stammered the May girl what here grinned young kenilworth oh no said the May girl that showing the slightest offence she seemed suddenly to be quite positive about it oh no if I live anywhere, it's going to be in the grey stone house with Mr. Keats. It's so infinitely more convenient to the schools. To the what? chuckled Kenilworth. Before the very evident astonishment and discomfiture in George Keats's face, his own was convulsed with joy. To the schools, dimpled the May girl. You do me a, a very great honour, bowed George Keats. His face was scarlet. Thank you, said the May girl. In the second somewhat panicky pause that ensued, Rollins flopped forward with his notebook. Rollins evidently had been waiting a long and impatient time for such a pause. Now speaking of drinking to drown one's sorrows, beamed Rollins. But we weren't, observed George Keats coldly. But you were this morning triumphed rollins from the flapping white pages of the little black notebook he displayed with pride the entries that he had already made a separate name heading each page mrs delville mr delville mr keats miss davies the list began now take the hypothesis 
glowed Rollins, that everybody has got just two bottles stowed away for all time, the very last bottles, I mean, that he will ever own, rum, rye, benedictine, anything you choose, and eliminating the first bottle as the less significant of the two. What are you saving the last one for? demanded Rollins. From a furtive glance at Alan John's graying face and the May girl's somewhat startled stare, young Kenilworth looked up with a rather peculiarly glinting smile. Oh, that's easy, said he. I'm saving mine to break the head of some bally fool. And my last bottle, interposed George Keats quickly. My last bottle? In his fine ascetic face, the flush deepened suddenly again, but with the flush the faintest possible little smile showed also at the lip-line. Oh, I suppose if I'm really going to have a wedding, in that little grey toy house, it's up to me to save mine for a loving cup, claret, something very mild and rosy. Yes, mine shall be claret. With her pretty nose crinkled in what seemed like a particularly abstruse reflection, the May girl glanced up. Bene Benedictine, she questioned. Is that the stuff that smells the way stars would taste if you ate them raw? I really can't say, mused Kenilworth. I don't think I ever ate a perfectly raw star. At the night lunch carts, I think they almost invariably fry them on both sides. Night lunch carts, scoffed Keats, with what seemed to me like rather unnecessary acerbity. No, somehow I don't seem to picture you in a night lunch cart when it comes time to share your last bottle of champagne with, with Miss Dancy Prancy of the Sillies, wasn't it? My last bottle isn't champagne, flared young Kenilworth. It's scotch, and there'll be no Miss Anybody in it, thank you. His face was really angry, and one twitch of his foot had knocked half his village into chaos. Oh, all right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with my last bottle. He frowned. The next to the last one, as you say, is none of your business. But the last one is going to my old man. I come from Kansas, he acknowledged a bit shamefacedly, from a shack no bigger than this room, and my old man lives there yet and he's always been used to having a taste of something when he wanted it, and I guess he misses it some, and he'll be eighty years old the 15th of next December. I'm going home for it. I haven't been home for seven years, but my old man is going to get his scotch. If they yank me off at every railroad station and shoot me at sunrise each new day, my old man is going to get his scotch. Bully for you, said George Keats. All the same, argued the May girl, I think Benedictine smells better. With a little gaspy breath, somebody discovered what had happened to the village. Who did that? demanded Paul Brunswick. You did, snapped young Kenilworth. I didn't either, protested Brunswick. Why, of all cheeky things, cried the bride. Now see here, I admonished them, you're all very tired and very irritable and I suggest that you all pack off to bed. Helping the May girl up from her cramped position, George Keats bent low for a single exaggerated moment over her preferred hand. I certainly think you are making a mistake, Miss Davies, bantered young Kenilworth. For a long run, of course, Mr. Keats might be better, but for a short run I am almost sure that you would have been jollier in the brown bungalow with me. Time will tell, dimpled the May girl. Then I really may consider us formally engaged, smiled George Keats, still bending low over her hand. He was really rather amused, I think, and quite as much embarrassed as he was amused. No, not exactly formally, dimpled the May girl, but until breakfast time tomorrow morning. Until breakfast time tomorrow morning did young Kenilworth. That's the deuce of a funny time limit to put on an engagement. It's like asking a person to go skating when there isn't any ice. Is it? puzzled the May girl. What the deuce do you expect Keats to get out of it? quizzed young Kenilworth. 
in an instant the may girl was all smiles again he'll get mentioned in my prayers she said please bless mr keats my fiance till tomorrow morning that's certainly something conceded george keats it isn't enough protested kenilworth the may girl stared round appealingly at her interlocutors but the time is so awfully short she said and i did want to get engaged to as many boys as possible in the week i was here what what i babbled yes for very special reasons said the may girl i would like to get engaged to as many with a strut like the strut of a young band tam rooster rollins pushed his way suddenly into the limelight if it will be the slightest accommodation to you he affirmed you may consider yourself engaged to me to-morrow disconcerted as she was the may girl swallowed the bitter unexpected dose with infinitely less grimace than one would have expected she even smiled a little very well mr rollins she said i will be engaged to you to-morrow young kenilworth's dismay exploded in a single exclamation well you certainly are an extraordinary young person yes i know deprecated the may girl it's because i'm so tall i suppose before the unallayed breathlessness of my expression she wilted like a worried flower yes of course i know mrs delville she acknowledged that mock marriages aren't considered very good taste but a mock engagement she wheedled if it's conducted oh very 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 properly her eyes were wide with pleading of course i suggested if it's conducted very 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 properly across the may girl's lovely pink and white cheeks the dark lashes fringed down there will be no kissing affirmed the may girl oh shucks protested young kenilworth now you've spoiled everything out of the corner of one eye i saw rollins nudge paul brunswick it was not a facetious nudge but one quite markedly earnest the whole expression indeed on rollins's face was an expression of acute determination with laughter and song and a flicker of candlelight everybody filed upstairs to bed rollins carried his candle with the particularly unctuous pride of one who leads a torchlight procession and as he turned on the upper landing and looked back i noted that behind the almost ribald excitement on his face there lurked a look of poignant wistfulness i've never been engaged before he confided grinningly to paul brunswick i'd like to make the most of it passing into my own room i flung back the casement windows for a revivifying slash of wind and rain before i should collapse utterly into the white scrumptiousness of my bed frankly i was very tired it must have been almost midnight when i woke to see my husband's dark figure silhouetted in the bright square of the door through the depths of my weariness a consuming curiosity struggled did ann walter come back i asked she did said my husband succinctly and how did you get on with alan john oh i'm crazy about alan john i yawned amiably and then with one of those perfectly inexplainable nerve explosions that astonishes no one as much as it astonishes oneself i struggled up on my elbow but he's still got my best silver salt shaker in his pocket i cried it was then that the scream of a siren whistle tore like some fear-maddened voice through the whole house shriller than knives it ripped and screeched into the senses doors banged feet thudded there's alan john now i gasped it's the whistle the may girl gave him End of chapter two Chapter Three of Rainy Week by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Everybody looked pretty tired when they came down to breakfast the next morning, but at least everybody came down, even Rollins. 
Never had I seen Rollins so really addicted to coming down to breakfast. Poor Alan John, of course, was all overwhelmed again with humiliation and despair, and quite heroically insistent on removing his presence as expeditiously as possible from our house-party. It was his whistle that had screeched so in the night, and as far as he knew he hadn't the slightest reason or excuse for so screeching it, beyond the fact that, rousing half awake and half asleep from a most horrible nightmare, he had reached instinctively for the little whistle under his pillow, and, not realizing what he was doing, cried for help, not just to man alone, it would seem, but to high heaven itself. "'But however in the world did you happen to have the whistle under your pillow?' puzzled the bride. "'What else have I got?' answered Alan John. He was perfectly right. Robbed for all time of his wife and child, stripped for the ill-favoured moment of all personal monies and proofs of identity, sojourning even in other men's linen, what did Alan John hold as a nucleus for the new day, except a little silver toy from another person's shipwreck? Once I knew a smashed man who didn't possess even a toy to begin a new day on, so he didn't begin it. "'Well, of course, it was pretty rackety while it lasted,' conceded young Kenilworth. "'But at least it gave us a chance to admire each other's lingeries.' "'Negligés,' corrected George Keats. "'I said scare-clothes,' snapped young Kenilworth. "'Everybody who travels by land or sea, or puts in much time at house-parties, ought to have at least one round of scare-clothes, one really chic escaping suit.' "'The silver whistle is mine,' intercepted the May girl with some dignity. "'Mine and Alan John's. I found it and gave it to Alan John, and he can blow it any time he wants to, day or night. As long as you people all made so much fuss about it, and looked so funny,' dimpled the May girl transiently, "'we will consider that after this, any time the whistle blows, the call is just for me.' The May girl's gravely ingenuous glance swept down in sudden challenge across the somewhat amused faces of her companions. "'Alan John is mine,' she confided with some incisiveness. "'I found him, too.' "'Do you acknowledge that ownership, Alan John?' demanded young Kenilworth. Even Alan John's sombre eyes twinkled the faintest possible glint of amusement. "'I acknowledge that ownership,' acquiesced Alan John. "'Now see here, I protest,' rallied George Keats. "'Most emphatically, I protest against my fiancé assuming any masculine responsibilities except me, during the brief term of our engagement.' "'But your engagement is already over,' jeered young Kenilworth. "'Nice kind of lack and var you are, drifting downstairs just exactly on the stroke of the breakfast bell.' "'Until breakfast time were the terms, I believe. "'Now Rollins here has been up since dawn, "'banging in and out of the house, "'racing up and down the front walk in the rain. "'Now that's what I call real passion.' "'At the very first mention of his name, "'Rollins had come sliding way forward on the edge of his chair. "'He hadn't apparently expected to be engaged till after breakfast, "'but if there was any conceivable chance, of course. "'Already, any time.' beamed Rollins. "'Through breakfast time was what I understood,' said George Keats coldly. "'Through breakfast time was what I meant,' stammered the May girl. From the only too palpable excitement on Rollins's face to George Keats's chill immobility, she turned with the faintest possible gesture of appeal. Her eyes suddenly looked just a little bit frightened. "'Ah, uh, after all,' she confided, I, I didn't know as I feel quite well enough to be engaged so much. Maybe I caught a little cold yesterday. Sometimes I don't sleep very well. Once— Oh, come now, insisted young Kenilworth. Don't, for heaven's sake, be a quitter. A quitter? bridled the May girl. Her cheeks went suddenly very pink, and then suddenly very white, like an angry little storm cloud that absurd fluff of grey hair shadowed down for an instant across her sharply averted face. A glint of tears threatened. Then out of the grey and the gold and the blue and the pink and the tears, the jolliest sort of little girl giggle issued suddenly. "'Oh, all right,' said the May girl, and slipped with perfect docility, apparently, into the chair that George Keats had drawn out for her. 
George Keats, I really think, was infinitely more frightened than she was, but in his case at least a seventeen years lead in experience had taught him long since the advisability of disguising such emotions. Even at the dining-table of a sinking ship, George Keats, I'm almost certain, would never have ceased passing salts and peppers, proffering olives and radishes, or making perfectly sure that your coffee was just exactly the way you liked it. In the present emergency, to cover not only his own confusion but the May girls, he proceeded to talk archaeology. By talking archaeology in an undertone with a faintly amorous inflection to the longest and least intelligible words, George Keats really believed, I think, that he was giving a rather clever imitation of an engaged man. What the May girl thought no one could possibly have guessed. The May girl's face was a study, but it was at least turning up to his. Whether she understood a single thing he said, or was only resting, whether she was truly amused, or merely deferring as long as possible her unhappy fate with Rollins, she sat as one entranced. Slipping into the chair directly opposite them, young Kenilworth watched the proceedings with malevolent joy. Between his very frank contempt for the dullness of George Keats' methods, and his perfectly palpable desire to keep poor Rollins tantalized as long as possible, he scarcely knew which side to play on. Everybody, indeed, except Anne Walter, seemed to take a more or less mischievous delight in prolonging poor Rollins's suspense. Alan John never lifted his eyes from his coffee-cup, but at least he showed no signs of disapproval or haste. Even George Keats, to the eyes of a close observer, seemed to be dallying rather unduly with his knife and fork, as well as with his embarrassment. As the breakfast hour dragged along, poor Rollins's impatience grew apace, fidgeting round and round in his chair, scowling ferociously at anyone who dared to ask him for a second service of anything, dashing out into the hall every now and then on perfectly inexplainable errands. He looked for all the world like some wry-faced clown performing by accident in a business suit. "'Really, Rollins,' admonished my husband, "'I think it would have been a bit more delicate of you if you'd kept out of sight somehow till Keats' affair was over. This hovering round so, through the harrowing last moments, all ready to pounce, hanged if I don't think it's crude.' "'Crude? It's plain buzzardy!' scoffed Kenilworth. It was the bride's warm, romantic heart that called the time limit finally on George Keats's philandering. "'Really, I don't think it's quite fair,' whispered the bride. Taken all in all, I think the bridegroom was inclined to agree with her. But stronger than anybody's sense of justice, it was a composite sense of humour that sped Rollins to his heart's desire. Even Anne Walter, I think, was curious to see just how Rollins would figure as an engaged man. The May girl's parting with George Keats was at least mercifully brief. "'Does he kiss my hand?' questioned the May girl. "'No, I think not,' flushed George Keats. Having no intention in the world of kissing any woman in earnest, it was not in his code, apparently, to kiss a young girl in fun. Very formally, with that frugal, tight-lipped smile of his, which contrasted so curiously with the rather accentuated virility of his shoulders, he rose and bowed low over the May girl's proffered fingers. "'Really, it's been a great honour. I've enjoyed it immensely,' he conceded. "'Thank you,' murmured the May girl. In a single impulse everybody turned to look at Rollins, only to find that Rollins had disappeared. "'Hi there, Rollins!' "'Rollins!' shouted young Kenilworth. "'You're losing time!' As though waiting dramatically for just this cue, the hall portiers parted slightly, and there stood Rollins, grinning like a Cheshire cat, with a great bunch of purple orchids clasped in one hand. Now we are sixty miles from a florist, and the only neighbour of our acquaintance who boasts a greenhouse is a most estimable but exceedingly close-fisted flower-fancier who might under certain conditions i must admit give bread at the back door but who never under any circumstances whatsoever has been known to give orchids at the front door nor did i quite see rollins even in a rainstorm actually breaking laws or glass 
to achieve his floral purpose yet there stood rawlins in our front hall at half-past nine in the morning with a very extravagant bunch of purple orchids in his hand well bully for you gasped young kenilworth now that's what i call not being a mutt beaming with pride rawlins stepped forward and presented his offering the grin on his face never wavering just a just a trifling token of my esteem miss davies he affirmed to say nothing of of the may girl i think had never had orchids presented to her before it is something indeed of an experience all in itself to see a young girl receive her first orchids the faint astonishment and regret to find that after all they're not nearly as darling and cosy as violets or roses or even carnations the sudden contradictory flare of sex pride and importance flashed like so much large print across the may girl's fluctuant face why why they're wonderful she stammered producing from heaven knows what antique pincushion a hat-pin that would have easily impaled the may girl like a butterfly against the wall rawlins completed the presentation but the end it seemed was not yet fumbling through his pockets he produced a small wad of paper and from that small wad of paper a large old-fashioned seal ring with several strands of silk thread dangling from it of course at such short notice beamed rawlins one couldn't expect to do much but if you don't mind things being a bit old-timey this ring of my great uncle abner's if we tie it on perhaps whereupon lashing the ring then and there to the may girl's astonished finger rawlins proceeded to tuck the may girl's whole astonished hand into the crook of his arm and start off with her still grinning to promenade the long sheltered glassed-in porch across whose rain-blurred windows the storm raged by more like a sound than a sight the may girl's face was crimson well it was all your own idea you know this getting engaged taunted kenilworth it was not a very good moment to taunt the may girl my husband saw it i think even before i did really rawlins he suggested you mustn't overdo this arm-in-arm -arm business not all day long it isn't done not this ball-and-chain idea any more not this shackling of the betrothed no really rawlins old man urged young kenilworth you've got quite the wrong idea you say yourself you've never been engaged before so you'd better let some of us wiser guys coach you up a bit in some of the essentials coach me up a bit growled rawlins why you didn't suppose for a minute did you persisted young kenilworth tormentingly that there was any special fun about being engaged you didn't think for a moment i mean that you were really going to have any sort of a good time to-day not both of you i mean eh jerked rawlins stopping suddenly short in his tracks but with the may girl's reluctant hand still wedged fast into the crook of his arm he stood defying his tormentor eh what why i never in the world mused kenilworth ever heard of two engaged people having a good time the same day one or the other of them always has to give up the one thrilling thing that he yearned most to do and devote his whole time to pretending that he's perfectly enraptured doing some stupid fuddy-duddy stunt that the other one wanted to do it's simply the question always of who gives up now miss davies for instance mockingly he fixed his eyes on the may girl's unhappy face now miss davies he insisted more than anything else in the world to-day what would you like to do so said the may girl and you mr rawlins persisted kenilworth if it wasn't for miss davies here what would you be doing to-day i quickened rawlins i across his impatient irritated face an expression of frankly scientific ecstasy flared up like an explosion why those shells you know glowed rawlins that last consignment why i should have been cataloguing shells there you have it cried kenilworth either you've got to sew all day long with miss davies 
or else she'll have to catalogue shells with you. So, hooted Rollins. Oh, I'd just love to catalogue shells, cried the May girl. In that single instant the somewhat indeterminate quiver of her lips had bloomed into a real smile. By a dexterous movement, released from Rollins's arm, she turned and fled for the door. Upstairs, you mean, don't you? she cried. The smile had reached her eyes now. In another minute it seemed as though even her hair would be all laughter. At the big table in the upper hall, where you were working yesterday? One on one side of the table, and one the other? And one the other! she giggled triumphantly. With unflagging agility, Rollins started after her. What I had really planned, he grinned, was a walk on the beach. Arm in arm, mused young Kenilworth. Eh, hey, you think you're so smart, don't you? grinned Rollins. Yes, quite so, acknowledged Kenilworth. But if you really want to see smartness on its native heath, just pipe your eye tomorrow when I dawn on the horizon as an engaged man. You, called the May girl, staring back through the mahogany banisters, her face looked quite striped with astonishment. You certainly announced your desire, said Kenilworth, to go right through the whole list, didn't you? Oh, but I didn't mean everybody, parried the May girl. Her mouth and her eyes and her hair were all laughing together now. Oh, goodness me, not everybody, she gesticulated with a fine air of disdain. Not the married men, explained the bride. No, I'm sure she discriminated against the married men, chuckled the bridegroom. Well, she shan't discriminate against me, snapped young Kenilworth. Absurd as it was, he looked angry. Young Kenilworth, one might infer, was not accustomed to having women discriminate against him. You made the plan, and you'll jolly well keep it, affirmed young Kenilworth. Oh, all right, laughed the May girl. If you really insist, but for a boy who's as truly unselfish as you are about nursery governessing other people's palm dogs and saving your last taste of anything for your old, old daddy, you've certainly got the worst manners. Manners, drawled George Keats. This is no test. Wait till you see his engagement manners. Oh, she'll wait, all right, sniffed young Kenilworth, and turned on his heel. Paul Brenswick, searching hard through the shipping news in the morning paper, looked up with a faint shadow of concern. What's the grouch? he questioned. Standing with her hands on her bridegroom's shoulders, the bride glanced back from the stormy window to Kenilworth's face with a somewhat provocative smile. Well, it was in the mind of God, wasn't it? she said. What was? demanded young Kenilworth. The rain, shrugged the bride. Oh, damn the rain, cried young Kenilworth. I wish people wouldn't speak to me. It drives me crazy, I tell you, to have everybody blabbing so. Can't you see I want to work? Can't anybody see anything? Equally furious all of a sudden at everybody, he swung around and darted up the stairs. Don't anybody call me to lunch, he ordered. For heaven's sake, don't let anyone be idiot enough to call me to lunch. Even Anne Walter's jaw dropped a bit at the amazing rudeness and peevishness of it. It was then that the beaming grin on Rollins's face flickered out for a single instant of incredulity and reproach. Why, Miss Walter, he choked, you didn't have your tooth fixed, after all. With a great crackle of paper, every man's face seemed buried suddenly in the shipping news. No, I heard my husband's voice affirm with extravagant precision, not the slightest mention anywhere of any maritime disaster. Not the slightest, agreed George Keats. Not the slightest, echoed Paul Brenswick, with what seemed to me like quite unnecessary monotony. It was the bride who showed the only real tact. Slipping her hand casually into Ann Walter's hand, she started for the library. Let's go see if we can't find something awfully exciting to read today, she suggested. Once across the library threshold, her voice lowered slightly. Really, Miss Walter, she confided, there are times when I think that Mr. Rollins is sort of crazy. So many people are, 
acquiesced Anne Walter without emotion. Caroming off to my miniature conservatory on the pretext of watering my hyacinths, I met my husband, bent, evidently, on the same errand. My husband's sudden interest in potted plants was bewitching. Even the hyacinths were amused, I think. Yet even to prolong the novelty of the situation there was certainly no time to be lost about Rollins. Truly, Jack, I besought him, this Rollins man has got to be suppressed. Oh, not to-day, surely, pleaded my husband. Not on the one engagement day of his life. Poor Rollins, when he's having such a thrill. Well, not to-day, perhaps, I conceded with some reluctance. But to-morrow, surely. We never have been used, you know, to starting off the day with Rollins, and two breakfasts in succession. Well, really, it's almost more than a human heart can stand. Far be it from me, I argued, to condone poor Alan John's lapse from sobriety, or advocate any plan whatsoever for the ensnaring of the very young or the unwary. But all other things failing, I argued, I should consider it a very great mercy to the survivors if Rollins should wake to-morrow with a slight headache. No real cerebral symptoms, you understand. Nothing really acute, but just— Oh, stop your fooling, said my husband. What I came in here to talk to you about was Miss Walter. Walter or Stolter? I questioned. Who said Stolter? jerked my husband. Oh, sometimes you say Walter, and sometimes you say Stolter, I confided. And it's so confusing. Which is it, really? Hanged if I know, said my husband. Then let's call her Anne, I suggested. With an impulse that was quite unwanted in him, my husband stepped suddenly forward to my biggest, rosiest, most perfect pot of pink hyacinths, and snapping a succulent stem in two, thrust the great gorgeous bloom incongruously into his buttonhole. Never in fifteen years had I seen my husband with a flower in his buttonhole. Neither in all that time had I ever seen him flush across the cheekbones, just exactly the shade of rose-pink hyacinth. I could have hugged him. He looked so confused. Oh, I say, he ventured quite abruptly, Miss Walter and I, you know, we never went near the dentist today. So I inferred, I said, from Rollins's observation. What were you doing? Truly, I didn't mean to ask, but the long-suppressed wonder most certainly slipped. Why, we were just arguing, groaned my husband, round and round and round. Round what? I questioned, now that the slipping had started. Round and round the country? Country, no, indeed, grinned my husband unhappily. We never left the place. Never left the place? I stammered. "'Why, where in creation were you?' "'Why, first, said my husband, "'we were down at the end of the driveway, "'right there by the acacia trees, you know. "'She was crying, so I didn't exactly like to strike the state highway "'for fear somebody would notice her. "'And then afterward, when I saw that she really couldn't stop... "'Crying?' I puzzled. "'And Walter, crying?' "'And then afterward,' persisted my husband, we went over to the bungalow on the rock, and commenced the argument all over again. Fortunately, there was some tea there, and crackers, and sardines, and enough firewood. But it was the devil and all getting over. We ran the car into the boathouse and took the punt. I thought the surf would smash us, but— But what was the argument? I questioned. Why about her coming back? said my husband. Why, she was so absolutely determined not to come back. I never in my life saw such stubbornness, and if she once got away I knew perfectly well that she never would come back, that she'd drop out of sight just as— and such crying! He interrupted himself with apparent irrelevance. Everything smashed up altogether at once. Hadn't cried before, she said, for eight years. Well, it's time she cried, the poor dear, I affirmed sincerely, but— But I couldn't bring her back to the house, insisted my husband. Not crying so, not arguing so. No, of course not, I agreed. I kept thinking she'd stop, shivered my husband. Jack, I asked quite abruptly, who is Anne Walter? Search me, said my husband. I never saw her before. You never saw her before, I stammered. Why, 
why you called her by name you i knew her face said my husband i've seen her picture in london it was in hal Ferry's studio fifteen years ago if it's a day a huge charcoal sketch all swoops and smooshes just a girl holding up a small hand mirror to her astonished face the woman with the broken tooth it was called fifteen years ago i gasped the the woman with the broken tooth what a what a name for a picture yes wasn't it said my husband and you'd have thought somehow that the picture would be funny wouldn't you but it wasn't it was the grimmest thing i ever saw in my life sketched just from memory too it must have been no man would have had the cheek to ask a woman to pose for him like that to reduplicate just for fun i mean that particular expression of bewilderment which he had by such grim chance surprised on her unwitting face such a shock such astonishment it wasn't just the astonishment you understand of marred beauty worrying about a dentist but a look the stark staring chain lightning sort of look of a woman who back of the broken tooth linked up in some way with the accident of the broken tooth saw something suddenly that god himself couldn't repair it was horrid i tell you it haunted you even if you started to hoot you ended by arguing arguing and wondering fairy finally got so that he wouldn't show it to anybody people quizzed him so yes but fairy i questioned no said my husband it was only by the merest chance that i heard the name Anne stolter associated in any way with the picture hal fairy never told me anything not a word but he never exhibited the picture i noticed it was a point of honour with him i suppose if one lives long enough of course one's pretty apt to catch every friend off guard at least once in his facial expression but one doesn't exhibit one's deductions i suppose one mustn't at least make professional presentation of them yes but ann walter stolter i puzzled when she tried to bolt so was it because she never knew that you knew hal fairy when you called her stolter and dropped the lantern so funnily when you first saw her was it then that she linked you up with this something whatever it is that has hurt her so and determined even then to bolt at the very first chance she could get but why in the world should she want to bolt i puzzled certainly she's had to take us on faith quite as much as we've taken her and i i love her in the flare of the open doorway george keats loomed quite abruptly oh is this where you bad people are he reproached us we've been searching the house for you oh of course if you really need us conceded my husband but even you i should think would know a flirtation when you saw it and have tact enough not to butt in a flirtation scoffed keats you at ten o'clock in the morning all trimmed up like an easter bonnet and acting half scared to death it looks a bit fishy to me not to say mysterious all husbands move in a mysterious way their flirtations to perform observed my husband from one pair of half laughing eyes to the other george keats glanced up with the faintest possible suggestion of a sigh really you know said george keats there are times when even i can imagine that marriage might be just a little bit jolly oh never jolly grinned my husband but there are times i frankly admit when it seems a heap more serious than it does at other times less serious you mean corrected keats more serious grinned my husband oh for goodness sake let's stop talking about us i protested and talk about the weather it was the weather that i came to talk about exclaimed george keats do you think it will clear to-day he questioned for a single mocking instant my husband's glance sought mine no not to-day george he said uh mm, mused george keats then in that case he brightened suddenly if mrs delville is really willing to put up a waterproof lunch we think it would be rather good sport to go back to the cave and explore a bit more of the beach perhaps and bring home heaven knows what fresh plunder from the shipwrecked trunk oh how jolly i agreed but will mrs brenswick go mrs brenswick isn't exactly keen about it admitted george but she says she'll go and brenswick himself and miss walter and alan john 
it was amusing how everybody called alan john alan john without title or subterfuge or self-consciousness of any kind with their arms across each other's shoulders the bride and bridegroom came frolicking by on their way to the foot of the stairs oh miss davies miss davies they called up teasingly are you willing that alan john should go to the cave to-day smiling responsively but not one atom teased the may girl jumped up from her tableful of shells and came out to the edge of the balustrade to consider the matter alan john alan john she called do you really want to go why yes admitted alan john if everybody's going behind the may girl's looming height and loveliness the little squat figure of rawlins shadowed suddenly miss davies and i are not going said rawlins not going questioned the may girl not going chuckled rawlins unless she walks with me he didn't say arm in arm he didn't need to that inference was entirely expressed by the absurdly triumphant little glint in his eye i don't think the may girl intended to laugh but she did laugh and all the laugh in the world seemed suddenly on rawlins no really people rallied the may girl i'd heaps rather stay here with mr rawlins and work on these perfectly darling shells one on one side of the table and one on the other we are going to have lunch up here in fact counterchecked that rascally rawlins with a blandness that was actually malicious there is a magnificent specimen here i notice of triton's trumpet the pacific islanders i understand use it very successfully for a tea-kettle and for teacups with the aid of one or two hare's ears which i'm almost sure i've seen in the specimen cabinet hare's ears gasped the may girl it's the name of a shell my dear just the name of a shell explained rawlins with some unctuousness very comfortable here we shall be i am sure beamed rawlins very cosy very scientific very ro romantic if i may take the liberty of saying so very oh shucks interrupted george keats quite surprisingly if miss davies isn't going there's no good in anybody going thank you murmured ann Walter. at the astonishingly new and relaxed timbre of her voice everybody turned suddenly and stared at her it wasn't at all that she spoke meltingly but the fact of her speaking meltedly that gave every one of us that queer little gasp of surprise still icy cold but fluid at last her voice flowed forth as if it were for the very first time with some faint suggestion of the real emotion in her mind thank you mr keats mocked ann Moulter, for your enthusiasm concerning the rest of us oh i say deprecated george keats you know what i meant his face was crimson it it was only that miss davies was so awfully keen about it all yesterday everybody you know doesn't find it so exhilarating no murmured ann Walter. in the plushy black sombreness of her eyes a highlight glinted suddenly suppressed tears make just that particular kind of glint so also does suppressed laughter i was out in a storm once drawled ann Walter. i found it very exhilarating with a flash of rather quizzical perplexity i saw my husband's glance rake hers wincing just a little she turned back to me with a certain gesture of appeal cry one day and laugh another is it she ventured experimentally going to the dentist isn't very jolly you're quite right interposed the bride no it certainly isn't sympathized everybody it was perfectly evident that no one in the party except my husband and myself knew just what had happened to the dentistry expedition and ann Walter wasn't quite sure even yet i could see whether i knew or not the return home the night before had been so late the commotion over alan john's whistle so immediate the breakfast hour itself such a chaos of nonsense and foolery certainly there was no object in prolonging her uncertainty i liked her infinitely too much to worry her very fortunately also she had a ready eye the one big compensating gift that fate bestows on all people 
who have ever been caught off their guard even once by real trouble she never muffed any glance i noticed that you wanted her to catch oh i hate to think anne dear i smiled about there being any tears yesterday but if tears yesterday really should mean a laugh to-day oh to-day quickened anne Wolter. who can tell about to-day then you really should like to go said george keats across anne Wolter's shoulders a little shrug quivered why of course i'm going said anne Wolter. good famous rallied george keats now that makes how many of us he reckoned kenilworth no let's not bother about kenilworth said my husband you queried george keats yes i'm going acquiesced my husband and you mrs delville of course no i think not i said just the brenswicks then counted george keats and alan john and once again from the railing of the upper landing the may girl's wistfully mirthful face peered down through that amazing cloud of gold-gray hair alan john alan john she called very softly i'd like to have you dress warmly you know and not just get too absolutely tired out and be sure and take the whistle she laughed very resolutely and if anybody isn't good to you you just blow it hard and i'll come as befitted the psychic necessities of a very cranky person with a future young kenilworth was not disturbed for lunch and Rollins, it seemed, was grotesquely genuine in his desire to picnic upstairs with the May girl and the shells. Even the May girl herself rallied with a fluttering sort of excitement to the idea. The shell table, fortunately, was quite large enough to accommodate both work and play. Rollins certainly was beside himself with triumph, and on Rollins's particular type of countenance there is no conceivable synonym for the word triumph except ghoulish glee really it was amazing the way the may girl rallied her gentleness and her patience and her playfulness to the absurd game she opposed no contrary personality whatsoever even to rollins's most vapid desires unable as he was either to simulate or stimulate the light that never was on land or sea it was rollins's very evident intention apparently to blue his lady's eyes and pink his lady's cheeks by the narration, at least, of such sights as never were on land or sea. Flavoured by moonlight, rattling with tropical palms, green as arctic ice, wild as loon's hoot, science and lies slipped alike from Rollins's lips with a facility that even I would scarcely have suspected him of. Lands he had never visited, adventures he had never dreamed of, cannibals not yet born, babble, babble, babble babble as for the may girl herself as far as i could observe not a single sound emanated from her the entire day except the occasional clank of her hugely oversized betrothal ring against the palm dog's collar or the little gasping phrase oh no mr rollins not really that thrilled now and then from her astonished lips as elbows on table chin cupped in hand she sat staring blue-eyed and bland at her tormentor it must have been five o'clock almost before the beach party returned gleaming like a great bunch of storm-drenched jonquils the six adventurers loomed up cheerfully in the rain-light once again george keats and the bridegroom were dragging the bride by her hand anne Walter and my husband followed just behind alan john walked alone even young kenilworth came out on the porch to hail them hi there called my husband hi there yourself retaliated kenilworth oh we've had a perfectly wonderful day gasped the bride found the cave all right triumphed keats alan john found a found an old-fashioned hoop skirt giggled the bride the devil he did hooted rollins but we never found the trunk at all scolded the bridegroom either we were way off in our calculations or else the sand in a sudden gusty flutter of white the may girl came round the corner into the full buffet of the wind it hadn't occurred to me before just exactly how tired she looked why hello everybody she began faltered an instant crumpled up at the waistline 
and slipped down in a white heap of unconsciousness to the floor. It was George Keats who reached her first, and, gathering her into his long, strong arms, bore her into the house. It was the first time in his life, I think, that George Keats had ever held a woman in his arms. His eyes hardly knew what to make of it, and his tightened lips, quite palpably, didn't like it at all. But after all, it was those extraordinarily human shoulders of his that were really doing the carrying. Very fortunately, though, for all concerned, the whole scare was over in a minute. Ensconced like a queen in the deep pillows of the big library sofa, the May girl rallied almost at once to joke about the catastrophe. But she didn't want any supper, I noticed, and dallied behind in her cushions when the supper hour came. "'You look like a crumpled rose,' said the bride. "'Like a poor, crumpled, white rose,' supplemented Anne Walter. "'Like a very long-stemmed, poor, crumpled, white rose,' deprecated the May girl herself. Kenilworth brought her a knife and fork, but no smiles. George Keats brought her several different varieties of his peculiarly tight-lipped smile, and all the requisite table silver besides. Paul Brenswick sent her the cherry from his cocktail, and promised her the frosting from his cake. The bride sent her love. Anne Walter remembered the table napkin. Alan John watched the proceedings without comment. It was Rollins who insisted on serving the May girl's supper. It was his right, he said. More than this, he also insisted on gathering up all his own supper on one quite inadequate plate, and trotting back to the library to eat it with the May girl. This also was his right, he said. Truly he looked very funny there, all huddled up on a low stool by the May girl's side, but at least he showed sense enough not to babble very much. And once, at least, without reproof, I saw him reach up to the May girl's fork and plate, and urge some particularly nourishing morsel of food into her languidly astonished mouth. It was just as everybody drifted back from the dining-room into the library that the May girl wriggled her long, silken, childish legs out of the steamer rug that encompassed her, struggled to her feet, wandered somewhat aimlessly to the piano, fingered the keys for a single indefinite moment, and burst ecstatically into song. None of us except my husband had heard her sing before. None of us indeed except my husband and myself knew even that she could sing. The proof that she could smote suddenly across the ridge of one's spine like the prickle of a mild electric shock. My husband was perfectly right. It was a typical boy soprano voice, a chorister's voice, clear as flame, passionless as syrup. As devoid of ritual as the multiplication table, it would have made the multiplication table fairly reek with incense and Easter lilies. Absolutely lacking in everything that the tone sharks call colour, yet it set your mind a haunt with all the sad crimson and purple splendours of memorial windows. Shadows were back of it, and sorrows, and mysteries, bridles, and deaths the prattle alike of the very young and the very old, carol and threnody, and a fearful transiency as of youth itself passing. She sang, There is a green hill far away without a city wall, where our dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. And she sang, From the desert I come to thee, On a stallion shod with fire, And the winds are not more fleet Than the wings of my desire. Like an innocent pouring kerosene on the flame of the world, The young voice soared and swelled to that lovely limpid word desire. In the darkness I saw Paul Brenswick's hand clutch suddenly out to his mates. In the darkness I saw George Keats switch around suddenly and begin to whisper very fast to Alan John. And then she sang a little nonsense rhyme about rabbits, which she explained rather shyly she had just made up. She was very fond of rabbits, she explained, and of dogs too, if all the truth were to be told. Also cats. 
also shells sniffed young kenilworth yes also shells conceded the may girl without resentment ha sniffed young kenilworth oh ah jealous lover this deprecated george keats really miss davies he condoned i'm afraid to-morrow is going to be somewhat of a strain on you to-morrow dimpled the may girl ha to-morrow shrugged young kenilworth it was the rabbits dimpled the may girl that i was going to tell you about now it's a very moral song written specially to deplore the the thievish habits of the rabbits but i can't seem to get around to the deploring until the second verse all the first verse is just scientific description adorably the young voice lilted into the nonsense oh the habit of a rabbit is a fact that would amaze from the pinkness of his blinkness and the blandness of his gaze in a nose that's so a twinkle like a merry periwinkle and goodness me that voice the babyishness of it the poignancy should one laugh should one cry clap one's hands or bolt from the room i decided to bolt from the room both my husband and myself thought it would only be right to telephone dr braun about the fainting spell there was a telephone fortunately in my own room and there is one thing at least very compensatory about telephoning to doctors if you once succeed in finding them there is never an undue lag in the conversation itself but tell me only just one thing i besought my husband so i won't be talking merely to a voice this dr braun of yours is he old or young fat or thin jolly or he's about fifty said my husband fifty-five perhaps stoutish rather i think you'd call him and jolly oh why ting-a-ling ling ling urged the telephone bell across a hundred miles of dripping rain-bejeweled wires dr braun's voice flamed up at last with an almost metallic crispness yes this is dr braun yes this is mrs delville jack delville's wife yes we just thought we'd call up and report the safe arrival of your ward and tell you how much we are enjoying her yes i trust she didn't turn up with any more lame halt or blind pets than you were able to handle oh no no not at all i hastened to affirm certainly it seemed no time to explain about poor alan john but what i really called up to say i hastened to confide is that she fainted this afternoon and yes crisped the clear incisive voice again fainted i repeated yes fainted i fairly shouted oh i hardly think that's anything murmured dr braun his voice sounded suddenly very far away and muffled as though he were talking through a rather soggy soda biscuit she faints very easily i don't find anything the matter it's just a temporary instability i think she's grown so very fast yes she's tall i admitted everything else all right queried the voice the wires were working better now i don't need to ask if she's having a good time essayed the voice very courteously she's always so essentially original in her ways of having a good time even with strangers even when she's really feeling rather shy oh she's having a good time all right i hastened to assure him three perfectly eligible young men all competing for her favour only three laughed the voice you surprise me and speaking of originality i rallied instantly to that laugh she has invented the most diverting game she is playing at being engaged to a different man every day of her visit oh very circumspectly you understand i hastened to affirm nothing serious at all no i certainly hope not mumbled the voice again through some maddeningly soggy connection because you see i'm rather expecting to marry her myself on the fifteenth of september next End of chapter three